Zaytun, page 94, Wednesday, August 31st. Zaytun woke with the sun and crawled out of his tent. The day was bright, and as far as he could see in any direction, the city was underwater. Though very, every resident of New Orleans imagines great floods knows that such a thing is possible in a city surrounded by water and ill-conceived levees, the sight in the light of day was beyond anything he had imagined. He could only think of Judgment Day, of Noah, and forty days of rain, and yet it was so quiet, so still, nothing moved. He sat on the roof and scanned the horizon, looking for any person, any animal or machine moving, nothing. As he did his morning prayer, a helicopter broke the silence, shooting across the treetops and heading downtown. Zaytun looked down from the roof to find the water at the same level as the night before. He felt some relief in knowing that it would likely remain there, or even drop a foot once it reached an equilibrium with Lake Pachere train. Zaytun sat beside his tent, eating Sierra like he had salvaged from the kitchen. Even with the water no longer rising, he knew he could do nothing at home. He had saved what he could save, and there was nothing else to do here until the water receded. When he had eaten, he felt restless, trapped. The water was too deep to wade into, its contents too suspect to swim through. But there was a canoe, he saw it, floating above the yard, tethered to the house amid the devastation of the city, standing on the roof of his drowned home. Zaytun felt something like inspiration. He imagined floating alone through the streets of his city. In a way, this was a new world, unchartered. He could be an explorer. He could see things first. He climbed down the side of the house and lowered himself into the canoe. He untied the rope and set out. He paddled down Dart Street, the water flat and clear, and strangely, almost immediately, Zaytun felt at peace. The damage to the neighborhood was extraordinary, but there was an odd calm in his heart. So much had been lost, but there was a stillness to the city that was almost hypnotic. He coasted away from his home, passing other bicycles and cars, their antennae scra scraping the bottom of his canoe. Every vehicle, old and new, was gone and salvageable. The numbers filled his head. There were a hundred thousand cars lost in the flood, maybe more. What would happen to them? Who would take them once the waters receded? In what hole could they all be buried? Almost everyone he knew had left for a, two day, for a day or two, expecting little damage. He passed by their homes, so many of which he painted and even helped build. Calculating how much was lost inside, it made him sick. The anguish this would cause, no one he knew had prepared for this adequately or at all. He thought of the animals, the squirrels, the mice, rats, frogs, possums, lizards, all gone. Millions of animals drowned. Only birds would survive this sort of apocalypse. Birds, some snakes, any beast that could find high ground ahead of the rising tide. He looked for fish. If he was floating atop water shared with a lake, surely fish had been swept into the city. And on cue, he saw a murky form darting between submerged tree branches. He remembered the dogs. He rested his paddle on his lap, coating trying to place the pets he'd heard crying in the dark. He heard nothing. He was conflicted about what he was seeing, a fractured version of his city, one where homes and streets were bisected and mirrored in this oddly calm body of water. The novelty of the new world brought forth the adventurer in him. He wanted to see it all, the whole city, what had become of it, but the builder in him thought of the damage how long it would take to rebuild, years, maybe a decade. He wondered if the world at large could already see what he was seeing, a disaster, mythical in scale and severity. In his neighborhood, miles from the closest levee, the water had risen slowly enough that he knew it was unlikely that anyone had died in the flood, but with a shudder he thought of those closer to the breaches. He didn't know where the levee had failed, but he knew anyone living nearby would have been quickly overwhelmed. He turned on Vanessa's place and headed south. Someone called his name. He looked up to see a client of his, Frank Nolan, a thick and robust man of about 60, leaning out from a second-story window. Zaytun had done work on his house a few years ago. The Zaytuns would see Frank and his wife occasionally in the neighborhood, and they exchanged warm greetings. Zaytun waved and paddled over. You got a cigarette? Frank asked, looking down. Zaytun shook his head, no, and coasted closer to the window where Frank had appeared. 
It was a strange sensation piling over the man's yard. The usual barrier that would prevent one from guiding a vehicle up to the house was gone. He could glide directly from the street, diagonally across the lawn, and appear just a few feet below a second-story window. Zaitun was just getting accustomed to the new physics of this world. Frank was shirtless, wearing only a pair of tennis shorts. His wife was behind him, and they had a guest in the house, another woman of similar age. Both of them were dressed in t-shirts and shorts, suffering in the heat. It was early in the day, but the humidity was already oppressive. You think you could take me to where I can buy some smokes? Frank asked. Zaitun told him that he didn't think any store would be open and selling cigarettes this day. Frank sighed. See what happened to my motorcycle? He pointed to the porch next door. Zaitun remembered Frank talking about his motorcycle, an antique bike that he had bought, restored, and lavished attention on. Now it was under six feet of water. As the water had risen the day before, Frank had moved it from the driveway up to the porch and then to his next door neighbor's porch, which was higher. But now it was gone. They could still see the faint blurred likeness of the machine, like a relic from the previous civilization. He and Frank talked for a few minutes about the storm, the flood, how Frank had expected it, but then hadn't expected it at all. Any chance you could take me to check on my truck? Frank asked. Saitun agreed, but told Frank that he'd have to continue on a while longer. Saitun was planning to check on one of his rental properties about two miles away. Frank agreed to come along for the ride and climb down from the window and into the canoe. Zaitun gave him the extra paddle and they were off. Brand new truck, Frank said. He had parked it on Fountain Blue, thinking that because the road was a foot or so higher than Vanessa's, the truck would be spared. They made their way up six blocks to where Frank had parked the truck, and then Zaitun heard Frank's quick intake of breath. The truck was under five feet of water and had migrated half a block. Like his motorcycle, it was gone, a thing of the past. You want to get anything out of it? Zaitun asked. Frank shook his head. I don't want to look at it. Let's go. They continued on. Soon they saw an older man, a doctor, Zaitun knew, on the second floor porch of his white house. They paddled into the yard and asked the doctor if he needed help. No, I've got somebody coming, he said. He had his housekeeper with him, he said, and they were well set up for the time being. A few doors down, Zaitun and Frank came up on a house with a larger white cloth billowing from the second floor window. When they got closer, they saw a couple, a husband and wife in their 70s, leaning out the window. You surrender, Frank asked. The man smiled. You want to get out? Zaitun asked. Yes, we do, the man said. They couldn't safely fit anyone else in the canoe, so Zaitun and Frank promised to send someone back to the house as soon as they got to Claiborne. They assumed there would be an activity there, that if anybody anywhere would have a police or military presence, it would be Claiborne. The main thoroughfare nearby. We'll be right back, Saitun said. As they were paddling away from the couple's house, they heard a faint female voice. It was kind of a moan, weak and tremulous. You hear that, Saitun asked? Frank nodded. It's coming from that direction. They paddled toward the, house, the sound and heard the voice again. Help! It was coming from a one-story house in Nashville. They coasted toward the front door and heard the voice again. Help me! Zaitun dropped his paddle and jumped into the water. He held his breath and swam on the porch. The steps came quicker than he thought. He jammed his knee against the masonry and let out a gasp. When he stood, the water was up to his neck. You okay? Frank asked. Zaitun nodded and made his way up the steps. Hello, the voice said, now hopeful. He tried the front door. It was stuck. Zaitun kicked the door. It wouldn't move. He kicked again. No movement. With the water now to his chest, he ran his body against the door. He did it again and again. Finally, it gave. Disheartened.